Our first talk is here. Uh, Intercloud identities, the risks and mitigations of non-human access between cloud providers. Before we get started, two quick announcements. First, uh, as always, I'd like to thank our sponsors, especially Trust on Cloud. Uh, accelerate your cloud journey with the right controls. Trust on Cloud provides an exhaustive threat model for cloud provider services like Amazon S3, Google BigQuery, and Azure OpenAI to discover the right controls required to mitigate any identified threats. Trusted by global systemic banks, Fortune 500, and defense agencies, customers use our product to accelerate their service onboarding, service security assessment, service allow listening processes, which they have found can reduce the time to adopt new cloud services by up to 70%. Additionally, Trust on Cloud allows you to continuously monitor and address any gaps in control coverage for existing services, ensuring you meet your risk appetite and stay current with changes in cloud services. Second, Forward Cloud Sec is interactive. That means we always save time for Q&A, and we hope you will ask questions. At the end of the talk, please raise your hand. I will bring you this mic, and everyone on the internet will be able to hear you. So please welcome Arya Tan and Noam Dahan. Is that working? OK, nice. Hey, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be the first talk. Uh, we're going to discuss the risks and mitigations of non-human access between cloud providers. My name is Arya Tan. This is Noam Dahan. We're both research engineering managers at uh, Tenable. This is the agenda for today. We're going to quickly go over the uh, trend of multi-cloud adoption. We'll talk about attacks on uh, multi-cloud uh, providers. Noam will share uh, TDPs and exploitation methods. And we'll give you a few methods to detect this kind of attacks if it happens to your organization. So uh, as you know, multi-cloud adoption uh, is on the rise in the past few years. This is a survey by Statista where we can see that there's almost 80% adoption of multi-cloud in uh, small businesses, while in large enterprises, the number is near 95%. Why are more and more organizations using multi-cloud? Well, I guess you, you're already familiar with that, so let's go over it uh, quickly. Uh, one of the main reasons for this is flexibility and uh, cost efficiency. By spreading workloads between different providers, uh, organizations can choose the best uh, uh, services and pricing according to their need, and with that, reduce the cost of their operations. So for example, one cloud provider may have a, a lower cost storage, while the other have a, a special service for machine learning. And with that, organizations can choose the best from all uh, providers. Another uh, reason for this trend is redundancy and disaster recovery. Uh, using multiple uh, uh, providers reduces the risk of downtime or data loss. And uh, in case of an outage, workloads can quickly just shift to another, uh, keeping the business running smoothly with no, uh, with no major impact. Of course, security is also a key factor. Each provider has its own security uh, features and setup, and by combining different uh, services from different providers, uh, organizations can build a strong and solid uh, security setup, which is uh, especially important uh, in industries with uh, strict regulations, but not, but not only. And one thing worth mentioning is that when we're talking about multi-cloud, it's not necessarily just multi-public cloud, but it could be a mix also of uh, uh, hybrid deployments or private cloud with the public cloud, right? Many organizations are going that way because with that you get uh, the best of both worlds, right? On, on one hand, you get the, uh, the privacy and control of the, public, of the private cloud, but you also get the innovation and uh, flexibility of the public cloud. So, when we're talking about multi-cloud, it's, multi, it's not just multi-public cloud, but could be a mix of somehow uh, different clouds. Now, this trend of multi-cloud is relevant not only for uh, organizations, but also for attackers, right? From their perspective, they want to uh, hack once and win big, meaning gaining full control over the victim's environment, uh, including all providers, in just a single hack, right? They, know, they don't need to hack each and every provider uh, independently. They do it by either uh, deep understanding of the victim's environment and each cloud provider's services uh, 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 engines, or sometimes just by accident, right? They could somehow get to a workload um, and that has multiple uh, cloud credentials configured on it and just see that they have the opportunity to also go to AWS, also Azure, and with that they could pivot between different, uh, different cloud providers. And of course, one of the best targets for uh, attackers in this kind of attack is the, uh, the IDP itself. Now, we know that attackers and also red teaming are already using tools that have the capability of multi-cloud credentials extraction. A few examples for it would be LeanPs and WinPs, 
Both are open source projects. Uh, you can see that they're very popular, more than uh, 15,000 stars. Um, PEAS stands for Privileged Escalation Awesome Script, and basically those tools could help attackers understand uh, PE opportunities within a workload. They're not built for uh, 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 cloud uh, pivoting or providers pivoting, but they could help an attacker in case they get to a workload that has those credentials to understand that and take advantage uh, of it. This is how the credentials extraction looks like. In uh, WinPs, you can see that this, the script searches for specific paths and uh, files related to AWS credentials and uh, G Cloud and Azure uh, and so on and so forth. And also, this is the implement implementation in LeanPs. It's even, uh, they have more, more files and more, uh, and more uh, locations. And yet again, those tools were not built for cloud pivoting, right? But they could give the opportunistic hacker the chance uh, of doing so. Um, those tools, as I said, are very popular. And what I want you to know is that the threat is real. The tools are out there and available. Uh, and attackers are already taking advantage uh, of those tools. No. Cool. So now let's move over to the identity provider side of things a little bit. Because when we're talking about connections between clouds, that's always going to be one of the central axes. And we have the, this, uh, this deployment where you have your data center or on-prem deployment. There you have an LDAP and a, a Active Directory not AAD, uh, you have your uh, other, other clouds, and ultimately it all has to work together as well as, you know, your cloud-based SaaSes and all, and what have you. And so for that, you usually need an IDP. Uh, but IDP isn't the only way to connect that. I think generally you could divide the ways in which these things are connected to about four categories. The first is secrets, which you're, we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive into, but you're all rather familiar with. The second is identity providers themselves. The third is workload federation mechanisms. Some great talks uh, I think I saw on the agenda for later today and tomorrow about workload federation, how do you federate uh, uh, applications from one cloud to another and from on-prem to cloud, and third-party integrations as well we see as these vectors for cloud hops, right? Because if I'm running my production cluster in AWS, but I'm connecting to third-party roles in a customer's GC CP account, that's also a connection that someone may end up exploiting. So we see the public and private clouds are interconnected pretty strongly. With secrets, what are our issues, right? Should be probably familiar with this, but firstly, leakage. They leak all the time. We can't seem to stop it. Once they leak, they are never forgotten, and that's always an issue. Of course, rotation schedules are always difficult. Storage, where do you store them, especially when we're looking at the hybrid situation rather than the public to public, but also the configuration of public cloud secrets is always a problem. And in the end, they're probably the vector that, that is most used right now for these hops because attackers just land on the machine, they happen to find a secret, and they hop. They land on a CI CD that we've seen, and while they land on a CI CD, they find a cloud credential, they make a hop to uh, the cloud credential, as well as, uh, sorry. So, 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 oh, and, and uh, a different sort of exploitation technique, which you may remember we've seen in the wild, we've had log for shell, right? And everybody was sharing these exploitation strings for LDAP that, that they saw there, uh, JNDL. And a lot of those strings were to look for the AWS credentials or the AWS environment variable. So again, you're landing on one machine. You don't necessarily know what you're doing in the strictest sense, but you end up making that hop. Uh, the second thing is attacking the identity provider explicitly. And we've seen that as a significant attack ve vector in the major breaches of the past year. So Scattered Spider, Midnight Blizzard, of course, uh, these identity-based attacks. And trivially, one of the reasons for that is the potential is really juicy. We've done a lot of examination of the data in uh, cloud environments, and we see that while non-human identities is, are rightfully garnering a lot of attention because they're difficult to control, there are a lot of them, human identities, as far as privilege, are kind of where it's at because they tend to be overwhelmingly highly privileged. You see more than a third of them are actually admin, and you see 85% of them are significantly privileged, which means significant business risk if you're compromising them. So if you can get that, you're gold as an attacker. So naturally, we're seeing attacks. And one of these attack techniques that we've seen, this is from, you don't have to read all of this, I'll explain. Uh, this is from an advisory by Okta, 
is using org-to-org -org application capability to federate from one Okta to a different Okta as a pivot and a persistency and a stealth device by attackers. And this is something that Okta themselves have, uh, have shared with the community as, okay, we're seeing a lot of attackers doing this. We're worried about it. So let's dive a little bit into the mechanization of that. Like what's an org-to-org -org pivot? Because I think some of the writing has been slightly unclear on the, me and on the mechanics of that TTP. So how do you set it up? So let's say we have our victim Okta, right? It's a company called company.com and it has a bunch of users, right? Among them like the CEO. Uh, and I'm the attacker and I wanna hack that company. So keep in mind this is a post exploitation TTP, right? I've already made the call to the call center. I have like a one time entry to a very strong user in the Okta instance, right? It's, it, 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 but, but that's what makes it a TTP. If you had something that's pre-auth, then obviously it would be remediated. This still exists and this is still exploitable. So I set up my own Okta and I start setting up the users. I set up the same users and I also set up my Okta org to org app. And if you're thinking critically about the security posture of this, you might notice that I've been allowed to set up these users. Nobody asked me, do you own the domain? Nobody asked me, can you verify these emails? Nobody asked me, are they legitimate? Because that's, that's the architecture. Enforcing that architecture globally would break a ton tons of customers. The thing is, though, that that's unremediatable, right? Because if I'm in the victim's octa and I'm like, no, I want email verification, that's meaningless because I'm setting up these emails in the attacker's account. I don't care what are the settings in the victim's account. So I set this up, I set an org to org app, and then I used like my one-time compromise of uh, the victim's octa to set up org to org trust. So I basically set it up so that I can federate from one octa to the next. This is called org to org octa applications. And then that I, once I have it, what do I do? And also it's important to say that there I can make my MFA uh, exem exemptions, I can make, sorry, my MFA exclusions, I can set everything up uh, to work for me. So now what do I do once I've set that up? I go to my attacker's Okta, I log in as like say the CEO, I have my screen of Okta applications, I federate into the victim's Okta application, and the magic is that now I'm fully federated as a completely legitimate login. So unless you catch that specific event, unless you catch that login, unless you catch that org to org setup, everything else looks completely clean. Everything else is essentially identical because I've logged in legitimately and I'm able to, so your logs in SSO, like in the infra, would look exactly the same. Your logs in Google Workspace would look exactly the same. Even your internal Okta logging other than the initial access would look largely the same. That enables me a reveal password technique, which I'll show in just a minute. It enables me to bypass MFA because I can set up my MFA exclusions. It enables me to log into any destination app that, I've, uh, that I want. It enables me a lot of stealth for the reasons I've just explained because it looks so similar to legitimate traffic uh, or legitimate logs, I should say. And it enables me persistency because once I've set it up, if you haven't noticed it, it's, it's like I don't know how many times you look at the uh, security SAML settings uh, 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 screen in your Okta if you're managing Okta, but I, I, I've not seen people look at it a lot because it's a one-time thing. You set it up when you're kicking out up and it's not like your daily flow of the dashboard and the applications and the permissions and the authorizations, the grants, the entitlements. It's not really there. It's something you did a, a million years ago, just left it there. So. Uh, one of the things you could do with that, and admittedly it is, uh, uh, I think it's quite cool, I don't know if it's the most practical thing in the world, but I think it's very cool, is to do a password reveal technique. Uh, why is a password reveal interesting? Because your users are setting up their Okta main passwords uh, uh, themselves, probably largely, and then they do password reuse because they are human and users, and they cannot remember you know, their, their base 64 passwords. Uh, and, and so some of them, you know, might have a really nice bank account and some of them might have a really nice, you know, identity to steal, God forbid. So uh, quite interesting to do a password reveal. The technique is as follows. I'm really, oh, okay, interesting. How do we do this? Uh, fun. Okay. We're clear. Uh, I really apologize for the blurry stuff. I'll just read it out really clearly. So one thing that's available in Okta, sorry, 
One thing that's available in Okta, and if you've ever had a blurry POC video, you know the feeling. Uh, what are we doing here? So the demo, gods, the demo gods are not supposed to be angry about videos. Videos are supposed to be the way to like, you know, assuage the demo gods. So in the interest of leaving RE time to talk to you all about uh, defense and detections, I'll explain the TTP because I think it would be quite useless to continue to watch me press the play button. Uh, what happens is this. If you look here, then there, when you're setting up Okta to talk to, like say Google, you have the ability to sync a randomly generated password or to sync the main Okta password. Okay, you can have your Google password be a randomly generated or your same password. That's just the setup that Okta offers. If you set it up to be randomly generated, the Okta application lets you expose the password. It, it like shows you the password. Why? Because you need to set it to set up like godforsaken things like POP3 and IMAP, right? You actually need the password itself. And so it shows you that. But if you're doing a sync, then it shows you a really nice image that says, I'm not gonna show you the password in the Okta app because that would be naughty. But if you are, you know, a little sneaky and you toggle back and forth pretty quickly, then it will show you the master password. Uh, and, and, and if you report it to Okta, they will say that's okay. Uh, <laughs> They're, they're aware of this issue. They have been aware of it for a long time and, and okay, they're aware of this issue. Um, so, and, and, and like I, to be perfectly honest, I, I, think, I think my way is like, is like the coolest. It looks the flashiest if you'd seen the video, but there's also a way to do it at scale that Authomize published really awesome research and an open source tool uh, to just set up a malicious SEIM and then do a password sync of your passwords to your malicious SCIM and you're syncing the entire table. So that's also a really awesome way to do it. That, that, and that, that, that is a feature, it's just a problem feature, but it is a feature, it is quite intentional. Uh, thanks, all right. Okay, so what can we do uh, as, a, as a defenders to detect these kind of attacks, right? According to uh, exactly what Noam just said. We're gonna suggest two approaches. One of them is uh, proactive and the other is reactive. We're gonna use Yara and Sigma, but before that, a disclaimer, those ways are not perfect, and there's no ideal solution to deal with those kind of attacks. It requires maintaining and uh, keep reading uh, regarding threats that are out there and uh, response accordingly, but, but that's a start, right? So we're gonna start with the proactive approach. Uh, as I said, for that, we're gonna use Yara. <clears throat> for those of you who are not familiar with Yara, uh, it's a, a binary uh, pattern matching, right? You can think of it as like a regex on a steroids. Uh, it can run against any kind of file, could be uh, executable, could be text, and usually been used by malware analysts or researchers who want to create a specific signature for a malicious campaign, malicious actor, or even a specific tool. We're gonna use it to detect tools that have the capability uh, of extracting multi-cloud uh, credentials like WinPs and LeanPs. This is how a Yara looks, a rule looks like. You can see that it has different, uh, this specific one has uh, three different categories of strings, one for AWS, one for Azure, and one for GCP. And each, each strings are somehow related to credentials extraction. For example, environment variables or specific paths uh, for all three uh, major uh, providers. And what's interesting is the bottom here that where it says the condition. We're looking to have at least one string for, uh, from AWS and at least one string from Azure, and at least one string for, uh, from GCP. Now, you can take this rule and deploy it into your uh, threat hunting engine, or you can deploy it into any entry point of your organization in order to scan each and every file before it gets in. And once, if you take this rule and deploy it, you will get uh, WinPs and LeanPs, of course. When we deployed it on our threat hunting engines, we were able to detect even a modified version of LeanPs, not something that is published on LeanPs.sh that uh, has even extended the capability to have a cloud, a Tencent cloud capabilities uh, as well. So this specific uh, Yara rule will detect not based on a specific hash or not based on a specific file, but on the actual content of the file. Keep in mind that if the file is encrypted, for example, and the strings are not available, this rule will not work, right? As I said, it's not perfect, but that's a start. That's the proactive approach. The reactive approach requires you guys, or us as an as a industry, uh, to take uh, all the publications that are available in the wild, 
uh, regarding uh, uh, specific threats and convert them into threat intel that we can process and deploy within our organization. So for example, this is a, a great uh, uh, publication by Permiso where they discovered a new Okta campaign, a password spraying campaign against Okta. And what's interesting is that at the bottom it says that the successful attempts uh, were created with a user agent Python request 2281. Okay, so it would be interesting to take this specific uh, uh, user agent and try to find uh, uh, login attempts or successful login attempts within my logs, IDP logs, uh, to see if this could somehow be uh, related to this specific campaign. For that, we will use Sigma. Uh, Sigma is a, is a generic uh, SIM uh, uh, query language which can then be translated into a specific uh, SIM uh, queries, for example, Splunk or Elastic or whatever you guys are using. You can convert the generic rule into your specific uh, uh, SIM. And this is how the Sigma rule looks like to detect this specific uh, uh, login attempts according to the publication I just showed. You can see that we're looking for a successful session start uh, event with the user agent, the, the somehow malicious or potentially malicious user agent, user agent. This could raise some false positives, right? But, but, but that's a start. And then using built-in tools in Sigma, you can convert them to Splunk query uh, or even Elastic query, and it's up to you. Now, if I just go back to what Norm said, the org to org uh, configuration, we can also offer, as, uh, as an example, a detection rule uh, or sigma rule for this specific one where we're looking to see the, uh, the trust established between those two different uh, uh, octas. Um, those are based on the victim's octa logs and not based on the attackers of the, and the configuration of the new uh, octa application. And you can take that and deploy it. So yet again, not perfect but some, somehow uh, a start. Yep. And uh, with our final 18 seconds, we'll leave you with this, which is attack, an attacker doesn't have to wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna do a multi-cloud attack. You build your tooling in a way that works with multiple clouds, and then you are poised to utilize any opportunity where you might land on a workload or a setup that's constructed as multi-cloud. And that's where we probably see these attacks coming from. Thank you so much. Outside. So, okay, so I'll ask uh, on behalf of Katie Knowles from Slack, for Okta org to org takeover, what, if any, pre-existing access or conditions are required? So you would need administrator access to the Okta. So the way it's been done in the attacks in the wild is usually a social engineering of an administrator user. But the thing is, I know it kind of feels like I got admin, so I won. But it's not necessarily about that. It's about how long you can stay alive post-exploitation, how stealthy you can be, and how some you can make yourself to evict. Uh, any other questions in the room? I have one. Sorry, go ahead. Can you Hands. disable uh, org-to-org transition? Question is, can you disable org-to-org -org transition? That's a great question. I'll, get, I'll try to get back to you on that. Like, can you disable adding a SAML? You can certainly detect it, which is what we've suggested, but can you disable it is an interesting question. I guess I have a, oh, sorry, go ahead, question for you. Just, can Okta just search for, I'm creating an email address and it's not what I signed up with? Uh, they would need to do that without consent on the attacker's instance, which would involve them doing it globally, which I don't know if they're able to do from a licensing standpoint. Uh, oh. Which teams do you recommend sort of take ownership of this? Is it sort of the monitoring teams who should be running it? Is it the people responsible for Okta? Like which teams tend to be the best place to protect and, and respond to this? Usually the detection rules are relevant for uh, SOC teams. Okay. Uh, and, and, uh, and they are the ones that are in charge of writing detection uh, rules and finding detection opportunities. So I would recommend those guys to, to use those. Guys. Yeah, security is a team sport though. So your detection team, unless they happen to be in this room or on YouTube, are probably not necessarily aware of this vector. And so we have to work together to say, okay, this is one of our things. It's like org policy we talked about last year. This is one of our red lines, things that should never happen. And if it's happening, you know, Raise, Raise the alarm. Any more questions? I have one. Yep. For, for like once org to org, it's okay. Uh, but like once org is open. So for once, like org to org has been set up, 
let's say Alice or Bob leaves the company, like have attackers figured out automated syncing of the you know, new users who come to the company to their malicious app, or is there a way to do that? So, so I th think setting it up the way, like that's Authomize's research, but they've made it available and pretty detailed, and I think the best way to do that would probably be to establish an SCIM sync, because then you're doing exactly, if you've done like Octatas, anyone in the room who's done Octatas SO, that's kind of exactly what it does, live syncs the users, so you could set it up that way, otherwise just like F5, you know, you can just like follow along, but that's obviously more difficult. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.